Before we start, I am not the end-all be-all of the information about this subject. There is a chance that I will make mistakes in this video, or some of the information presented may have become out of date. So make sure to do further research beyond my video to fact check me, keep me credible, and to make sure that you make a properly informed decision. Another disclaimer is that explanations in this video are being aimed at musicians in this context. Before making this video, I was honestly unaware that other audio communities were clinging to this listening medium. So if you aren't a musician, some of the examples and specific info may not apply to you, but there still is some good info here in general anyway. So, back to the video that you clicked on. IEMs in a nutshell are earbuds, but not stupid and garbage most of the time. At least for now. If it's not obvious, I kind of hate earbuds as a listening medium. The typical purpose for using IEMs is to lower the overall volume your ears have to endure, but keep your instruments and or band sounding crisp. Or, you know, other audio. Let's get this disclaimer out of the way. Sometimes there's a bit more to IEMs than the actual buds that go in your head. For some setups, it's easier to get started than others, especially if you're using them just for listening to music or something. So it's important to check out some other videos explaining IEM setups and not just IEMs themselves like this video. Because if you're doing instrument setups, typically it gets a little more complicated. If I have any videos out about IEM setups, I will hopefully link them in the description or put them in the iCard. If not, do a search on the channel if YouTube hasn't taken that feature away yet. Also, if you know about certain subjects or just want to jump around, some timestamps should be available in the description. So let's start with the most important thing, isolation and fitting. The most important thing to make sure of when getting in-ear monitors is that they can seal off the sound and feel good doing it. Depending on what price bracket you're in, you can get in-ears that are molded to the shape of your ear. But for the majority rest of us, the manufactured size can be a real decision maker. Most people's ears are different from one another, so some people have bigger holes than others. So some people might be able to cram larger, bulkier in-ears than others. Even if you have this type of ear, I would still suggest going for a small and sleek design. Most in-ears are leaning towards these weird jelly bean styles, but others take the risk and start looking like robo-audio enhancers. Finding the right shape for you can be one more step from keeping your in-ears from slipping out and keeping you from wishing you never had ears and pulling a Van Gogh. Another piece in the puzzle of keeping your in-ears in place, and keeping your hearing in general, is the tips. As far as my knowledge, most bud-like listening devices come with a few different size tips. Not only can finding the right size help keep your in-ears in, these tips can quite honestly be the life or death of your hearing. Getting the right seal in your ear is what keeps the noisy sounds out and your awesome sounds that you're making in. It's often recommended to all price ranges unless they already come with them that you get memory foam filled or built tips. These can be more reliable and should be able to bounce back from squishing and plume out in your ear to get a full seal on the ear canal much like your standard earplugs are designed to work. I got some of these tips recently and they really do work. Another possible issue that you might have is that your tips may not be compatible with your device. Sometimes there are different shape and size tip female ends and different male receiver ends on the IEMs. So you will either need to experiment with different tips in brands or do some research to make sure that they are compatible or made for the IEM model that you have selected. Let's move on to the next most important thing, the drivers. Drivers are an important area in IEMs because they can be important to the dynamics and range of what your IEMs can put out into your head. Typically more drivers would mean more dynamic range and clarity. But drivers can be designed for different purposes, and in some circumstances can provide more with less. Lower end IEMs try to keep the prices low by making monitors with fewer drivers that are more dynamic. Meanwhile, higher end IEMs will sometimes provide more than one driver for the different sound ranges, 
While I've never gotten to try high-end in-ears, my affordable KZs with dual drivers work great for listening to music while drumming. Basically, that means that these $25 IEMs cover the soundscape pretty good. Next up is voicing. Voicing in some ways goes together with the drivers. All audio output devices are voiced. Voicing is a fancy way to say that they sound a certain way, typically for a certain purpose. Voicing is made up of many factors all coming together to make the sound capabilities of your device. Construction, components, and sometimes even purpose-designed EQing can all play big roles in how any sound output device sounds. Speakers, headphones, and IEMs are often voiced for different listening experiences. While IEMs are often voiced for, for musicians, they can be voiced for best listening experience, for music and different genres, for gaming so you can hear your certain sounds better, or for musicians playing certain instruments. What voicing is good for you, in the end it's going to come down to preference coming from experience. But education isn't about leaving you high and dry. So here's some suggestions to point you in the right directions. Before we talk about what sound responses you want, we need to talk about where to go to find out what the response is and looks like. Every in-ear should have a sound range graph showing what ranges it covers better and where it lacks. Since Amazon is only loosely moderated, it could be in one of the listing pictures, it could be in the depths of the description, or if you're shopping from a brand that has no business selling this type of audio device, you may not even find one at all. Though that is typically a, a rare experience for in-ears, usually people who make these types of devices know what they're doing. When looking at the graph, the sound spectrum is measured in kilohertz. Lower numbers are bass frequencies. Mids are argued what range they really start at, but typically the 1k is the mid range, and the highest can start around the 3 to 5k and up. By the way, you may have noticed a lot of the devices lacking in the extreme high range. Around the 8k range is where you start to lose most sound clarity and start to get harmonics, air, and other typically unpleasant sounds. Typically, most people want to try to get a flat sound response. This is because, like studio monitors, most musicians want to hear everything neutrally or simply turn up what they want to hear more. Keep in mind, you will typically never find a perfect flat response. A decent affordable option that represents this, based on its graph, is the KZ ZS10 Pro set. However, you may notice most in-ears have a mid-scoop style voicing. This is because most people are kind of hosed for that style of voicing. In our situation, it provides a decent audible bass while giving a jangly clarity with the boosted high end. Typically, this voicing allows people to feel the rhythm more while not making the other instruments dull. Last, but of course not least, is durability. Durability is kind of a subjective area. Most products can last an indeterminate amount of time, either really long or really short. Most of these products are definitely in that area. There are so many factors to the subject that honestly I don't even really know how to address it. I don't have any experience taking IEMs out into the real world, so most of these are just kind of assumptions and speculations. So, most IEMs nowadays come with two pin disconnectable cords, so if the cord gets damaged in any way it should be an easy fix or upgrade. The ear tips that typically come with most IEMs are the thin rubber style, and they typically start to lose some of their shape and wear down or, you know, stuff like that. But, like I said before in this video, these can also be easily replaced with replacements or memory foam upgrades. The bodies are often too small and rigid to be snapped or crushed under most circumstances, though of course it can happen. The only easily damageable area I can think of is the speaker area that has to protrude out of the main body. This section, if put in the wrong position, could possibly be snapped. I don't know how much force it would take to break that off, and I don't honestly want to try. <laughs> the best way to keep from damaging them while traveling is to get a carrying case if they don't come with one out of the box. There's a few different options readily available on Amazon for a small range in pricing. Some cases are priced as low as $8, but may not stand up to being sat on or squished. 
and others are priced up to $20 but are rigid and can probably have many heavy items stacked on top of them before flexing or breaking. The only way to know how they stand up to the real world without buying them yourself is to look at reviews of the model you are looking at, though this can of course still be hit or miss because most people buying most affordable IEM models are just average people who aren't touring, gigging, and are most likely going to be in a controlled environment. So this video hopefully gives you a general idea of what to look for when buying IEMs. Like I said before, make sure to do more research on IEMs and keep in mind that oftentimes in music, there's more to getting good listening experience with in-ears than simply buying some good in-ears. Also, like stated in the beginning of the video, this video was aimed at musicians, but still hopefully had some good information for the rest of the people looking for info about IEMs. Though I want to make it clear that I don't think that IEMs will enhance your listening experience compared to most other listening mediums outside of the musicianship area. The main benefit of IEMs is, to, is that they seal off the outside sound. Otherwise, all the other sound and tonal benefits of IEMs can usually be matched by other methods of listening, like headphones and speakers. Especially if you're looking for in-depth spatial characteristics for music or gaming, because most IEMs aren't actually designed to replicate those effects. Though, of course, there might be some purpose-built models for those applications. So, if you found this video informative or somehow entertaining, then please leave a like. If you have any questions, I can try to answer them in the comments, but keep in mind I am not an expert on the subject, so I can only do my best. This is primarily a music channel that focuses on guitar and drum related content, though I try to do some other content here and there like music related gaming and 3D printing content. If any of that sounds good to you, then please consider subscribing. That's all I have to say, so for now, I'm going to say bye bye